Hi everyone, welcome back to Rich Reviews and today we're really pleased to be able to feature this beautiful white Range Rover Vogue SE to the channel for review. So first of all, I'm going to give you some back history on the Range Rover. Then we're going to take a walk around and talk through this specific specification of this car. Then we're going to take it out for a drive, all towards answering the question, does the Range Rover still deserve the accolade of the best all-round SUV? So British Leyland were actually responsible for inaugurating the Range Rover. They developed the prototype in 1967 and went into production in 1970. The first Range Rover had a powertrain with 127 brake horsepower, which was a version of the Rover V8. 127 brake horsepower, guys. This model is a 4.4 litre diesel with 350 brake horsepower and 740 newton metres of torque. That's how these Range Rovers are great at pulling things. Listen to that torque value, 740 newton metres of torque, over double its brake horsepower. The Range Rover has now run through five generations, so it's currently in its fifth generation. If you want to spec one online, you'll be specifying a fifth generation Range Rover. This model you see here is a fourth generation. And of course, British Leyland no longer own the brand. The brand is now owned by Jaguar Land Rover. So the proper true model name of this car is the Jaguar Land Rover Range Rover Vogue SE. Of course, we're not gonna say all that. So you know it and we know it as the Range Rover. This particular car has been lent to us by a good friend. So he's kindly let us review it for the channel. This car is actually a short term solution for the owner. He specified a brand new Range Rover Sport because he had a little bit of an accident in his previous Range Rover. So this is an interim solution, hence why, hence why he's decided to purchase this specification. This is an easy resellable spec, white, black trim and black wheels. Now Range Rover hasn't been without its issues. One of the key problems that they've had is with the air suspension. Now the ride quality of a Range Rover is well renowned and that is provisioned by its air suspension. And the air suspension uses certain rubber sections and rubber parts. And these rubber parts are prone to deterioration and prone to puncturing. Now, if you get a failure of one of these air struts and, and to, to, to provide this, this air suspension that uses air struts on each corner of the car, if you get a problem with these, with these air struts, um, whether it be punctured or whether you get deterioration of the rubber, um, then you notice it because the car will sag. For example, you know, this is obviously when the car is started because the car will generally um, sit low to make it easier for you to get in and out of the car because obviously it's quite high up. Um, when the car is, is switched on and when the car is, engine is running, you'll notice that if there's a problem with one of the air struts, the suspension will sag on that particular corner or if it's obviously multiple struts, then you'll get a sagging on all those struts. You can also notice it when you're driving the car, when you brake and if your front air struts are faulty, you'll notice that the car will lurch forward. Then this is a key problem or has been a key problem for Land Rover. So much so that third parties have actually provisioned a, a remediation approach whereby they will swap out all the air struts for standard stainless steel or steel coilovers. Now to replace an air strut on one of these cars, the part alone is around £2,000. And generally you should replace all four air struts. You shouldn't replace one or two of them. So if you're replacing all four air struts, you're looking at about six to seven, eight thousand pounds just for the parts, not including all the actual labour costs. 
And that's, that's not taken into account that while you've got it apart, if you find worn bushes and worn other suspension parts that may need replacing at the same time. So uh, this is why a lot of people go, go with third parties and go with replacement standard stainless steel coilovers if they get a lot of problems with the suspension. Another issue that these Range Rovers had was with regards to security. There was a situation whereby you could procure an electronic device from eBay, therefore it's freely available, and this device would give you access into the Range Rover. It pretty much anybody could gain one of these devices and hack access to your car and steal it. This caused such a problem that some of the top end insurance companies refused to insure London based Range Rovers for a period. So I'm going to give you a quick walk around of the standout key features of this car. First of all, soft close on the doors. Now most of the time you're going to normally slam a door and it's got the weight to be able to close by itself. But if you get to the stage where you're, you just sort of let the door drop, like it's not working. So if you get to the stage where you just let the door drop, it will actually self-close, so it's got soft close. And if you come around to the boot, it's got gestures or just the capability to be able to open up the boot. So if you wave your foot underneath this section, look at that. <laughs> Only with Range Rover. And then when you want to close it, just soft close with the button. Another key specification option that was chosen for this particular model is deployable tow bar, would you believe it? An electronic deployable tow bar. Okay, so how do we do that? First of all, open up the boot. Then you come to this inner control panel and you press this button here. How cool is that, guys? So the tow bar isn't fixed all the time you can actually deploy it electronically. And then we just press the same button again. And the tow bar folds away. Then to be able to close it, we've got two buttons on here. You can either use that button or this button. So you can use the tailgate button to close the rear hatch. Actually, <laughs> the tailgate on the rear hatch just closes the rear hatch, which is quite logical. This closes both, but because the rear hatch is now closed, it just closes the tailgate. And again, obviously soft close. Again, taking a quick walk around, this is the Vogue SC model. Now, you'd think the word Vogue imparts perceptions of high-end class, top-end model maybe. Actually, no, the Vogue was actually the base model, uh, but it comes with still a hell of a lot of refinements. Why would you possibly want to pay more if you don't have to? And the SE with this model name stands for standard equipment. So it's standard equipment. So this is actually the base model. But as you'll see when we're driving it, it's got a hell of a lot of standard equipment. Again, why would you possibly want to pay more? So from the outside, there's not much more I can really talk about. We've got the reversing camera placed here. This car also features the full panoramic sunroof, the fixed sunroof. We'll talk about that a bit more when we get inside and we'll show you that feature. Just walking around the outside, obviously you've just got black trim over white bodywork black wheels. And as I said, this specification was chosen just so it's easy for resale um, because it's got a, because the owner has got a Range Rover Sport on order. And of course, because of the way the situation is at the moment, it's going to take quite a while for that Range Rover Sport to arrive. So this is an interim solution. So now we're going to get in the car and see how it drives. First of all, I want to give you what my perception should be of this car. Now, obviously I've driven the car to this position, um, but removing that from my mindset, what are, what are we looking for from this car? Now, this is a Range Rover. It's supposed to be the highest end of class and comfort. So we're not looking for necessarily sporty, fast turning, sharp, aggressive suspension and road holding. Or well, what we're really looking for is comfort. We want, we want high end, classy equipment inside. We want high end materials inside and we want a very comfortable ride. That's the key features that we're looking for when we drive this car. So let's get in and drive it and see if it lives up to that accolade. So first of all, I'm going to talk you through some of the rudimentaries of getting in the car and waking the car up. The car uses keyless entry. This is why it was back in the day, it was easy to purchase a device off eBay, which would provide this in effect, um, either a boosting of the signal from this device or actually replacement for this device to be able to gain access to the car. So if we drop into the car, because it's keyless entry and keyless start, you just literally have to have this within the vicinity of the car. Obviously it's got an open and close section buttons on this as well, because the car will go to sleep after a while. 
So let's just put the key in there, you close the door. Now the first thing I noticed with this car is when you want to put the seatbelt on, it's got an armrest here. Now you have to lift the armrest up and I believe this is adjustable from this knob. I'm not quite sure what that adjusts. You've got, you've got so many configurable items on this car, guys. To wake up the car, you've got a start-stop button here. Now, if you want to start the car, you put your foot on the brake and press the start-stop button. But if you just want to wake it up, because it's a hybrid, it's a diesel hybrid, you press the start button and the car wakes up. And first of all, what you feel is that your seat comes to its memory position because the, the seats are all electrically controlled. To start the car, you put your foot on the brake and then you press the start button. Now this is a diesel V8, 350 brake horsepower, 4.4 litre, as I said, with 740 newton meters of, 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 um, of torque. So this is a diesel. Just listen to this modern diesel. It's as quiet as a petrol engine nowadays. Very impressive. It gives us the instant perception of something very well designed and very well optimized for comfort. First of all, you can't miss these two screens. So if we just go through some of the functionality, I'm not gonna go through it all because it's just, um, it'll take ages to go through all the different options within these screens. But if we just go through the, the seat options, for example, we've got two key options for the seats, heated seats and massage, would you believe it? So if I switch on the seats or seat, switch on the functionality for the seats, then you switch on through these particular buttons for each seat. Then if um, we've got the actual option switched on there, we've got the heating option selecting here. So I can now choose the heating of the seat. And here we can go up to plus three degrees. I believe it's in degrees. Or we can actually go to minus three as well. So that, I'm not too sure if that's actually degrees or if that's just settings. I believe it, it's probably just settings, thinking logically. So it will actually cool the seats as well, as well as heat them. Now I've been leaving mine on one, so we'll keep it as one. But if we select this other option here, this is the massage option. Now, if I now switch on the massage, I can then choose what type of massage I want on this seat. So if we go for, now I have to switch that back again. So if I go for, let's say, rolling, switch it on. Now, <laughs> I'm now getting a full massage, rolling massage on my back. And it's quite impressive, it's pretty good. I'm not too sure whether or not you'd want this sort of massage while you're driving, because maybe it could relax you so much, it could cause you problems, but we'll keep the, keep the heated seats on. If we now switch that heat functionality off, you'll be pleased to know that the heating of the seats and the climate control can be controlled separately by these knobs. So at the moment it's set on climate control, so we can just change the settings on the climate control, saying change the temperature up and down by moving this control knob. And if you press it in, you then gain access to the heated seats. So you can then change the temperature of the heated seats by moving this up and down. And that would definitely be my favorite approach for configuring the, the climate control and the, and the heated seats rather than going through the screens because the screens is too distracting. And you guys, you all know my opinions on these screens. I don't like these sort of modern screens in, in cars. I feel it's a big distraction. It ages the car very quickly. And if you're driving along, it's a, it's a safety hazard because if you're driving along and you're down touching all these screens all the time to set functionality. Obviously it's a distraction and you can have an accident. So I think in the future, all this will be outlawed and it will change back to more physical buttons. But I'm glad to see in the Range Rover that you can at least set the climate control and the seats with these with these two different buttons, left and right. And just to touch on this panoramic sunroof, would you believe that you've got gesture controls that you can use to open and close the blind on this panoramic sunroof? Absolutely flipping incredible. So for example, the blind is partly closed at the moment. I don't wanna close it because we've got one of our GoPro cameras there ready for when we're driving. So if I just wave in front of this section here, you see that the device will open. So that's closing it, I'll have to stop it now. So you actually wave to stop it, so wave forwards to close it, wave back to stop it, and then you can wave back again, and it will open. Now those sorts of electronic controls, I advocate. I think they're very good because using those gestures, as long as they're reliable, they're very useful if you're driving along because you don't have to take your, your eyes off the, you don't have to, because you don't have to take your eyes off the road or eyes off the screen if you're watching the screen. Obviously you should be watching the road predominantly, and you can just do this, to partly close the, you can do this to just partly close it. You can do that to stop the part closed. You can do that to fully open it again. Just makes it very easy. 
One of the other features I should talk about as well is that this car features HUD. Now, what does HUD mean? HUD means heads up display. That means instead of looking at these controls down here and taking your eye level down below the road, you can keep your eyes on the road and you're seeing in a heads up display on the screen, hopefully the camera will pick this up, but you're actually seeing on a heads up display, you're seeing the current speed limit of this road. You're seeing that the car is in park mode and you're seeing what the actual speed is that you're driving at. Obviously I'm at zero speed here because we're parked up. That is pretty cool. Again, a very good safety feature that I very much, um, that I very much agree with. So we're gonna put it into drive mode, first of all. And it's just driving like a normal automatic. So you keep your foot on the brake and you use the accelerator. Now, this is an old style automatic. Nice to see a proper stalk for the indicator as well. That uses, it's an old style automatic, which means it has the creep mode. So if you take your foot off the brake and you've got the car started, it will automatically start to creep forward. So this car features the 4.4 liter Rover V8 and it, it has an eight speed automatic gearbox. First of all, my first impressions are, it's a diesel, it's not the most peppy of cars to drive. It's, um, it's very comfortable, as you'd expect, very spacious inside in the cabin. The electronic controls we've already covered, I don't agree with all these electronic controls on screens, uh, but some of the controls have dual capability, so you can, or some of the controls have the functionality actually in buttons. So that's a lot better, obviously, but uh, a lot of the items are, are still configurable by the screen, which isn't great. So the car feels quite peppy when you consider it's a very heavy car. These Range Rovers are very heavy. We'll put in the weight here. This car has the 350 brake horsepower diesel V8 engine. Um, and it has an eight speed gearbox. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it's not a dual clutch gearbox, so hence why you get the old style creep when you take your foot off the brake, which is what you want for these, for these um, type of SUVs. In addition with the 350 brake horsepower, it's not gonna be the fastest thing off the line. You can't expect it to be highly performant. But the 740 Newton meters of torque really means that it's got great pulling capability, so good at a great amount of torque. Now I'm not used to driving this Range Rover, so for me, it feels like a boat, a bit of a boat. And I don't mean any disrespect to the Range Rover model. It's a beautiful car and it's, it's great for, and it feels great for a, for a daily driver, um, but it is a big car. But it does make it quite easy to place in the fact that you can see all four corners of the car. Um, well, all two front corners of the front bonnet of the car. It makes it a lot easier to place because you can definitively see where the car starts and ends on each corner. The turning circle in this car, as I'm finding out now, is pretty good, so not bad at all. The heads-up display makes it so usable with regards to keeping, and so safe with regards to keeping your eyes on the road. I can constantly see the speed that I'm doing, and I can see the speed limit. It's just, that's all the information really you need to see directly in front of you. You don't need to see a rev gauge. Um, you're not in a high performant car here. You're not looking at red line in the car or driving it crazily. You just want a comfortable, secure ride to get you from A to B. You've got a cruise control options at hand as well on the steering wheel. I'm not gonna use the cruise control. I don't need to use that here. You've also got a speed limiter embedded into the cruise control uh, functionality as well. If you're driving in an average speed control section, you can set it so as you don't exceed a certain speed limit. You know, when you, you know, you're, I'm driving along now, um, when you put your foot down, it's got a certain amount of pace to it. It's no slouch by any means. Very comfortable rides, you can imagine. You can also set it up for different driving options. So you've got a slow option and you've got this sport option as well. We'll put it into sport in a minute, just, just to see what the difference is in that mode. We're now gonna just drive it through one of these side little cut through lanes, which has got some speed bumps on it. Let's see how the air suspension manages those speed bumps. This is a 20 mile an hour speed limit, so we're not gonna be hurting along seeing what the suspension is like on these. We're just gonna see how it feels when we cover off these speed bumps. You can certainly feel them, so it's not super wallowy, um, but it's, comfort it's comfortable, it doesn't jar you. Unlike in my Bath, which has got rock hard sports suspension. When driving these cars, you can certainly see why they're so popular. It's such an easy car to drive, 
once you get used to the size. It's such an easy car when you're driving from A to B. You want something that's really comfortable and practical. And this has got all the options you can possibly want. Looking around at visibility now, rear view mirrors give you great visibility to the rear. Um, with regards to the front, you've got fairly small A pillars, so you've got a good all round frontal visibility. Looking in the back, you've got good visibility from the rear view mirror. Um, I'm not saying going to say you've got great visibility. You can see through the back without any issue, um, but it's not very wide. You're hampered with the headrests of the rear seats. Notwithstanding, you've got a great reversing camera in here. The whole centre section here is, is deployed when you use the reversing camera. So you've really got no issues whatsoever from that respect. You've also got the option um, of a 3D camera. So if you switch on the 3D camera capability, you've got a up, you've got a downward view on the car. So you can see every angle and every corner of the car when you're maneuvering the car. That provides for great maneuverability um, and great visibility as, you, as you'd expect. The beeping warning signal there. I wonder what the friggin' heck's that? Um, it's because we had a mini right up our backside, so it was uh, telling me, um, with regards to proximity controls, that there was a mini too close. Now, to change the driving control into sport, you actually have to push down on the driving mode selector and then you switch it into sport. Now, let's see what this provides. Yeah, definitely. It sharpens up the controls. It sharpens up the power for sure there. You can feel also it firms up the suspension slightly. I think if this was my car, I'd be driving in sport all the time. <laughs> Interesting, I'm just touching the brakes there and there's a little bit of jarring um, which feels like the, the discs might not be fully true. Interesting, yeah, there's, there's a little bit of vibration on the brakes when I when I touch the brakes. Uh, by out of true, what I mean is that there's a maybe a very, very slight warp or slight deviation on the discs and this usually happens if the discs have had a bit of wear. Sometimes you can clear up that problem if you actually brake hard if you brake hard on the on the brakes and clean them off a bit. I'm not saying that these discs are dirty, but you, you can often do that. When you're optioning your new Range Rover, it's a bit of a minefield because there's loads of different models. Generally you option your car, as with most cars nowadays, you specify it online through their website. So when you're specifying your Range Rover, you first of all select the model. Then when you've selected your model, you then select the trim option. Now trim options are, for example, autobiography, SVR and you've then got your high standard equipment or standard equipment options as well. Now when you first choose for example Range Rover model that will be classed as your standard equipment so that's your SE model. Then you can choose autobiography which will up the trim levels. Autobiography in effect is the upper level trim option that you can choose. Um, if you really want to go to extremes on the trim, you can choose the SVO option, which is the Special Vehicle Operations. And that, in effect, is very similar to Ferrari Atelier. You can then choose whatever colour, whatever options you want on the car. You can, very, you can tune it very bespoke to your requirements. Obviously, that's going to substantially increase the cost. With respect to cost of these, um, it, it ranges, excuse the pun, from the Range Rover model at the top end, the base model, is 100k, and then down to the Evoque, which is the lowest spec model, then you're adding your bespoke options, you're going to increase the specification of your car, and of course, adding cost to the end sum. purchasing these these Range Rovers what's the key things you're usually looking out for um, usually it comes down to looks desirability and build quality those are the key items you're looking for um, these cars are very desirable I'm not too sure how many of them sell but it's well known that they sell in quite high volumes so it's a very desirable daily driver and it's a very affordable daily driver now that may sound crazy when you think about the Range Rover top-end model having a base price of hundred grand how can I say that's affordable? Well, if you look at the 4x4s that are coming forward nowadays, you've got the Perisangue by Ferrari and you've got the Urus by Lamborghini. These are far substantial. These are far in excess of the price of a Range Rover. When you start looking at the prices of 
of the Urus and the Purasangue, the Range Rover starts looking like a bargain deal. It really does. If you're looking at the Parasangue, for example, that specified is around £400,000. Now, I know we're talking about a totally different model range here. We're talking about Ferrari, so in extremes of a desirability with regards to a model range. And we're talking about a Range Rover, but the Range Rover is by far from the lowest end. You know, got Audis and, and Mercedes, etc. I'm not saying they're lower end, but they're, they're not as desirable, I would say, as the Range Rover. And build quality is exceptional inside. I don't see any problems with build quality. A lot of build quality issues would come with time, so you'd have to live with these cars and understand what, what issues there could be with regards to build quality. Playing around with the controls inside the cabin, no issues whatsoever, nothing squeaky. It seems very quiet inside the cabin as well. Again, focusing a lot on the comfort side seats are very comfortable they actually support you very well in the kidneys uh, which quite surprised me actually um, notwithstanding of course you've got all the massage capability of the seats whether that's a, a good or bad thing obviously it's good from the comfort point of view but I'm not so sure you should be uh, having, <laughs> having, a, having a, a massage a sports massage while you're driving along uh, trying to get to your end destination especially if you've got quite a distance to drive Visibility, I've said already, is very good. The panoramic roof um, provides a nice feel of real airiness within the, within the cabin of this car. So, if I was specifying, if I was specking one of these cars, I definitely would go for the full-size panoramic roof. It's a very good option. And as we've already talked about, you've got the capability of the blind. So, if it's very power, if the sun's very powerful, you've got the capability to, to use the gesture controls to close the blind while you're driving. Focusing a bit on the design of this car now. The exterior design has been with us for years. Um, Range Rover model hasn't really changed much in its design. In that way, it's a bit like the 911. It has subtle changes. You know, why change something that isn't broken? So we're all used to, to the design and looks of a Range Rover. So you either like it or you don't. And I quite like it. It's, it's um, you know, it's very boxy in its design. Not as boxy as it used to be. It's more rounded off now on its corners. Um, I think it looks great. You know, there's no issue with that when you consider it's a 4x4 SUV. With regards to design it on the interior cabin, it's great. I mean, you've got great functionality. So for example, if we talk about the glove boxes, you've got an upper and lower glove box, which is electronically open with two separate buttons that are very closely located together. And um, we've already talked about the screens. I'm not too keen on these electronic screens for controlling um, a lot of the functions that they do. Um, but kudos to Range Rover for separating out some of the key functions that you'll be operating while you're driving to separate buttons hence the auto, the um, hence the climate control and the heated seats uh, uh, you can you can operate those from this from these knobs located on the center console also focusing on the center console again you've got um, great You've got great. Um, arm, you've got a great armrest there, which will hold your arm at the right height to be able to operate the screen and the different controls here down on the centre console. And um, you've got great options with regards to coffee cups. You've got a sliding drawer here, which opens up to re to reveal two large coffee cups, um, which are quite deep. That are really going to locate your coffee cups well, so your coffee's not going to spill. Which again, it's a comfort aspect. So it's not something that you necessarily require as a as a high requirement in a in a supercar but in a comfort in a in a 4x4 of its nature you would expect that one of the things that i am noticing with driving this car is that yeah the suspension is a bit wallowy um, again you've got to be very careful you don't compare this against supercars and sports cars because obviously it isn't it's a comfort suv um, but you definitely do get some floatability when you're going around the corners now that's just how it is you know with soft suspension of this nature in these SUVs you're going to get some floating capability. So in conclusion I'm just going to close out now. What's my thoughts on the Range Rover Vogue SE? Now my criteria as I set out beforehand was that this car should meet ideally comfort and desirability. Those, those are the key criteria really for this car. It needs to get you from A to B in great comfort and support and so that you're not agitated, stressed or, or that you're quite relaxed when you arrive at your destination at point B. Yes, it definitely does that, definitely. It's a very comfortable car, very spacious, very luxurious and a, a great daily driver. There's no doubt about that. I mean, it's a Range Rover. Hell, you know, they, they keep building these for a reason. 
For me personally, I like more of a sporty drive. For me, the suspension was just a bit too wafty, too, too boat-like, especially going around corners. It was a bit too soft and wallowy, and that was in its automatic standard configuration on suspension. So for me personally, I like it a little bit firmer, a little bit more taut, um, possibly the Range Rover Sport. If we can get hold of one of those to review and can do a comparison against this model, that would be a good example, I think, for me personally. I think the Range Rover Sport would be a bit more agile and a bit more sporty in its setup. But most people don't want that. Most people just want the Range Rover as a good A to B driver, which is what this is. So with regards to fulfilling that criteria, is it still fit for purpose of the accolade of the, of the best all-rounder 4x4? I would say yes, definitely it is so if you enjoyed the video please give it a thumbs up give it a like very important for the channel if you're not subscribed please think about doing so it's free to do so it doesn't cost you anything and you can unsubscribe at any time thanks a lot for watching guys and we're going to say goodbye from the Range Rover Vogue SE thanks a lot again to its owner for letting us review this car we'll be reviewing a lot more cars coming forward in the future in 2023 so if you're not subscribed get subscribed guys thanks a lot for watching and we'll catch you in the next video